and in danger of his life, Confucius expressed his equanimity as follows. Heaven gave me virtue. How can Huan Tui harm me? This implies that we receive our virtue from heaven. For the most part, Confucius appears to have taught that we receive from heaven our individual capacity for virtue. This may differ from individual to individual, but it is up to each of us to cultivate whatever moral potential we possess. This should be our major moral concern, and it was the failure to do so that caused Confucius' concern. Failure to cultivate virtue, failure to ponder upon what I have learned, inability to stand up for what I know is right, inability to reform my defects, these are the things that worry me. Te could also play an exemplary social role. Public order could be maintained either by punishment or by example. Lead the people by edicts, restrain them by punishment, and they will keep out of trouble but develop no sense of shame. Lead them by virtue, restrain them with ritual, and they will develop a sense of shame and reform themselves by joining together. This looks like optimism of the highest order. And in the context of 6th century BC China, during the troubled period of the Chao dynasty, when the country was ruled by squabbling petty dictators and warlords, such humane advice appears to be sublime lunacy. There was nothing whatsoever to be gained from such a course of action. Ruling made easy. A contented population. What next? What was significant about his attitude was its sheer originality. Day was nothing less than an evolutionary step forward. Compassion, nobility, example. These were indeed novelties in a world of primitive savagery. They appeared impossible. Their survival would need nothing short of a miracle. But the miracle eventually happened, both in China, with Confucianism, and in the West, with Christianity. Without this humanitarian element emerging from the savagery of internecine struggle, there would have been no humane civilization. One has only to look at the bloodshed and hideousness of ancient Egyptian and Mayan civilizations which advanced without this humanitarian element emerging. It is difficult to account for this impossible evolutionary step in human society which first became generally articulated by Confucius. What led him to propose this new humanity? We can only guess. With hindsight we can see that it was a way of allowing us to climb out of the mire of barbarism and fulfill our potential as human beings. Did Confucius instinctively realize this? The answer seems obvious. Confucius must have been inspired to such action by a belief in God, and a benevolent God at that. Alas, Confucius was at best an agnostic. He was all for the therapy of ritual, but when it came to a belief in God, an afterlife, or metaphysics of any sort, he remained distinctly evasive. Chi Lu asked how we should serve the spirits of the dead and the gods. The master said, You are not even able to serve man. How could you serve the spirits? May I ask about death? You do not even understand life. How can you understand death? Yet Confucius certainly had an unspoken belief in something. It was not transcendental, but it served much the same core purpose as any religion. He believed in the moral purpose of humanity. We have a duty to make ourselves better, to become as fully human as possible, and to become better human beings. This was the only meaningful way to live life. There were no rewards in the afterlife for success, or even punishments for failure, the enterprise was to be pursued for its own sake, regardless of the consequences. Here, more than two millennia before Darwin, was a secular religion utterly in accord with evolution. In its own way, this was an expression of the ultimate nobility in humanity, the pursuit of good for its own sake. Such high-flown sentiment is all very well, but how should we actually behave? Confucius was nothing if not practical, and his morality doesn't shirk from prescribing for the exigencies of behavior in day-to-day -day living. He advises, tame the self, and what you do not wish for yourself do not impose on others. It was a matter of attitude and consistency. Conduct your public affairs without resentment. Conduct your private affairs without resentment. 
we should aim to be without worries and without fear. But how? If, after self-examination, a man finds he has nothing to reproach himself for, then what has he to worry about? What has he to fear? To modernize, there appears to be just one damning flaw in Confucius's morality. Our morality tends to reflect the egalitarian aspects of our society, so it should come as no surprise that Confucius's morality reflects the primitive, class-ridden nature of Chinese society during the Chao dynasty more than two and a half millennia ago. Confucius saw morality as a matter of class. The people who fulfilled their moral potential became Gen. These were superior people, members of the ruling class. Ruling classes have always believed they are superior people, and the ruling classes of 6th century BC China didn't need Confucius to point out this self-evident truth. On the other hand, they didn't expect people to behave as they did. Heaven forbid! Do as I say, not as I do! Morality has always been beset by the class question. It's easy enough to be good when society is set up for your benefit and protection, but when the rules are not in one's favor, one feels less inclined to be good, a fact reflected in prison populations the world over, throughout history. Confucius may have appeared a snob here, but in fact his revolutionary notion of morality did attempt to circumvent the class issue. The superior man may have been upper class, yet if you behaved as he did, there was no difference between you and him. But there was more to it than that. The superior man exhibited exemplary behavior, in the literal sense of the word. The morality of the superior man was an example, or he simply wasn't a superior man. In this way, Confucius made his morality universal, applying to all classes in all periods. Even so, there are remnants of class distinction in some of his more practical moral advice. Duke Ching of Qi asked Confucius about government. Confucius replied, Let the ruler be a ruler, the subject a subject, the father a father, the son a son. The duke said, Excellent! Indeed, if the ruler is not a ruler, the subject not a subject, the father not a father, the son not a son, I could rely on nothing any more. I wouldn't even know where my next meal was coming from. Some have detected an element of irony in Confucius's sayings, noting the Duke's overriding concern with his stomach, but this seems unlikely. Confucius's morality may have been revolutionary, but politically he remained a dyed-in-the-wool conservative. This is hardly surprising, considering the political anarchy and misery he saw around him. In such times, it's not just the old fogies who feel the need for strong government, just like the good old days. To Confucius, the distant early years of the Chao dynasty appeared like a golden era. These had been times of firm government, cultural achievement, and stability, with the emperor ruling over his feudal lords. By Confucius's time, this feudal system was beginning to break up, the feudal lords turning into feuding warlords. In his eyes, the alternative to a stratified society was anarchy. Yet for Confucius, the fundamental element of a moral society was not class, it was love. Here it's worth comparing Confucianism and Christianity. Both subscribed to the fundamental credo of love one another. But Confucius was daring or optimistic enough to suggest that this could extend beyond the personal to society at large. Christianity drew short of prescribing for the state. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Christianity was to succeed as the slave morality of a vicious empire, placing great emphasis on the individual and his salvation, as well as a selfless love for others within the religion. Centuries later, such ideas would transmogrify into Marxism, though for the most part, government in the Christian West would remain pragmatic rather than principled. Confucianism, in adopting traditional Chinese virtues and pledging itself to a public morality, became synonymous with a Chinese way of life. Through the ages, its exemplary morality and love for one's neighbor would only very gradually evolve, much like China itself. And despite all fervent denials, elements of Confucianism would still be recognizable in Maoist Marxism. Yet even as Marxism ebbs, the link between the Chinese self-image and government remains as strong as ever. 
As China begins to absorb Western ideas, the understanding of such cultural similarities and differences will become increasingly important. Confucius deals specifically with his political philosophy in the thirteenth book of his sayings.